Welcome to the 10th of the many lectures in 7503 NSC Aviation Economics. Right throughout the previous many lectures that we've looked at, the feeling that you should have generated by now is that really, because aviation economics deals with mathematics and it deals with measurement, that it's important for airlines to be able to sit back and be able to track exactly how they are performing at the moment, being able to forecast to the future, be able to come up with good plans for the future, but to be able to track the implementation of those plans against their expectations. So measurement is a big part of success in airlines. That old adage that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And so measuring is very, very important. So this lecture, what we're going to be doing is to describe the role of performance and measurement in airline economics. We're going to be taking a look at the use of operations research, models, simulation and gaming. But we're just going to be doing this on the surface to understand it from a qualitative point of view. We're going to be take, talking about the impacts of load factors because we said load factor, the amount of people that you're carrying on board your aircraft compared to its seating capacity, is really important. It's not the be all to end all as we find out in the course, but it's an important one. We're going to be talking about managing the load factor metric, capacity versus demand, and the load factor management process and application. We're going to be explaining how modelling and simulation can be determined, used to determine and test airline requirements. This is really important for airlines because all the time they're saying, if our requirements change this, what's going to be the impact on operations? So those questions, what if? You really need to be able to do it. And finally at the end, we're going to be talking about the use of modelling using Massachusetts Institute of Technology Passenger Origin Destination System, or PODS model, and its applications. MIT is perhaps one of the leaders in the world of aviation economics, and they've invested a large amount of money in this actual modelling system which enables people to be able to sit down and actually put inputs into the model to simulate a particular airline operation and then be able to compete it against known competitors. So in this one, it's going to be just giving a feeling for the sorts of measurement that we want to look at. If we look at performance and measurements, we've got four key metrics, and these are traffic, that is, what you're carrying in terms of passage and freight, yield, the output that you get out, and the unit cost, because we said back in the early metrics that we did in the course, the cost per air C kilometre, or CASK, these are really important. The thing is that these are common to most businesses. And airlines improve their operating performance by, first of all, aiming to boost revenue. That is, how can we get more people to fly, fill the seats on board our aircraft and fly the routes that we have? At the same time, we want to get our costs down. So increased revenues and reduced costs means greater profit, and that's important. But at the same time, what we don't want to do is to be able to change passengers' expectations for the worse. That is, we don't want to reduce costs by having a poorer service and turning passengers off where they go to a competitor. The other thing, as we've said in previous lectures, is that for airlines today, even though people who travel on holidays or visit friends and relatives are an important part of the business. They only provide a very small part of the profits. A large proportion of the profits come from the business traveller. And so obvious airlines have to look at meeting that business traveller. For example, in Australia, if we look at Virgin Blue when it started, Virgin Blue was a great little low-cost carrier and it was performing gangbusters. But what happened in the global financial crisis? The people who would normally be flying to visit friends and relatives going on holidays, suddenly had less money and they stopped flying immediately. But business people have to fly in the bad times as well as the good times. And so they realise, hey, the only way to spread risk is to cater towards the business traveller as well. And so Virgin Blue became Virgin Australia, which is starting to look more and more like Qantas in the sense that it's catering for business travellers. And so this is important. If we take a look at 
airline operating performance. Going back to lecture two, we spoke about supply and demand, and we find that if we look at the demand side, using the diagram from Holloway's uh, book, Straight and Level, Practical Airline Economics, we find that we have the revenue drivers. And this can be, for example, uh, a weak economy, sluggish growth, excess output, such as we saw in Australia this year, uh, increased prices, market share pursuit. All of these can basically have a downward effect and they can produce a low low factor, a soft yield, and also increased price competition, which we saw between Qantas and Virgin Australia this year. This can cause a downward impact on the revenue stream. And then, of course, if we look at um, the cost drivers, if we have rising input costs, falling resource productivity, which, of course, Qantas has seen with some of its older aircraft particularly, we get the cost stream going up. And so what we do is we go from an operating profit, which Qantas had many years ago, to an operating loss, because, simply because the cost stream has gone up while the revenue stream has gone down. On the supply side, if we look at the cost drivers there, uh, for example, if we have uh, falling input costs, rising resource productivity, we can find that straight away we can actually force our costs down. At the same time, if we've got a strong economy, robust traffic growth, tight capacity with high load factors, uh, profit pursuit and firm yields and weak price competition, we can start to drive that revenue stream up and of course that gives us an operating profit. So the demand side and the supply side, this has been a very quick coverage, but you can see straight away with these two, extending on from what we saw in our earlier lecture, they can have a very, very strong impact on the way in which airlines operate. There are different types of uh, systems that air airlines can use to actually take a look at how markets are going to operate. And we have operations research, which is a discipline using advanced analytical methods. And we've got models. And of course, models are a very, very important part of the airline business. And of course, we can have a whole range of models. We can have uh, models that use mathematical concepts. And we look at some of the very simple ones, which show the relationship. Well, for example, we saw the relationship back in the supply and demand um, graphs that we showed in lecture two. We get different algorithms, equations, and historical data that are used to construct models. So a model itself is simply a representation of reality, but it has to be populated with the data to truly become useful to us. So we'll just look at the simple concepts there. We won't be going into deep mathematics. We will look at the concepts and how airlines use them. And we'll see that the models are an integral part of operations research and simulations of airline operations. And we'll be showing a simple example further on. If we look at simulation gaming, and simulation obviously is the operation of a model to represent uh, something in the real world. Gaming is more rule-based. Many of you will be uh, in that familiar with the electronic games. And of course, there are simple games where we can set up airlines and get people to compete against each other so that rather than having the Dungeons and Dragons game that you may be familiar with. This is a game where we actually fly one airline against the other. And the thing is, there's use for both of these. And these are used not just in the commercial field, but in the military field as well. We're focusing on the commercial field. The big thing is that when we sit down and take a look at the uh, different ways in which we can use our models, we can take a look at different examples. And we can uh, take a look, for example, at uh, two different airlines, Air Trans Airways and Continental Airlines. And we can see that the two different airlines had different types of aircraft, different sizes, narrow bodies, and we can see Continental had narrow bodies and wide bodies. And we will take a look at the reasons for the actual use of these aircraft. We'll take a look at the fact that there are different tools that help uh, in that look at these aircraft and say, okay, 
how do these two airlines perform with those two different fleets? And here we can see a diagram where on the course we'll go through and we'll take a look and we'll take a look at the results and it will give recommendations as to just what the airline should do in terms of buying new aircraft, whether it should switch to leasing of certain aircraft types and as to whether it should sell off certain older types. And this gives an idea of the tools that can be used by airlines to help their decision making. And we'll just be looking at enough to give you an idea that these tools are available, how they're used and the sort of results that they provide. We'll be looking at another pro, um, use of modelling and mathematics where we look at the impacts of load factors. And of course the one thing is that we know that airlines watch load factors very, very carefully. And we know that if a load factor is too low, it means you've got excess capacity. If it's too high, then it means that if you've overbooked, some people miss out on getting a seat. Now, optimised load factor means that you've got people who front up and they're given their seat and they're satisfied and they are the ones who go towards making profits for airlines. We'll take a look at the fact that airlines are always against traffic peaks and valleys and of course the one thing that we find is variations occur. Depends on the time of day that we fly, the time of the week. For example, we can expect Monday and Friday flights to always be fairly heavily packed. The month or season that we're flying, for example, on holiday season, seats are generally going to be all booked out, whereas during off-season there will be uh, seats available on certain times. We'll know that we need to make sure that we position flights to meet peak hour demands. And sometimes, in positioning those flights, going from where the aircraft's been maintained to where we want it, it may have to fly almost empty, simply to be there. And of course, an aircraft with empty seats is income that we've lost forever. We'll be looking at capacity versus demand. And this is where airlines can get into price wars, where they offer plenty of capacity to say to people, we have seats that you can fly and they're guaranteed. And, but if demand is low, it means the price for those seats is going to be low. We'll take a look at different things there. In terms of load factor, we, we will do a problem to take a look at load factor analysis for a particular airline. And the one thing that we will find by, by working through this problem is the importance of, first of all, getting the right and accurate data. Building up an idea of the demand distribution then estimating spill for alternate capacities. That is, if we start to reduce the number of seats on board an aircraft, that is, if we have an aircraft that was once configured for 120 seats and we change it down to only 100 seats, then some people are going to miss out on getting a seat. And we'll find out what the cost and revenue and profit impact is going to be on the airline. And this is taken from a model that was developed by the Boeing company, which they make available for people to help them understand the importance of load factor analysis in managing an airline. We'll look at the results of the analysis itself and we'll be able to take a look at the fact that, first of all, if we look at the data in the first place, we learn how to analyse to see, is this really representative data or does it have certain faults built into it? And then once we've done that, we can say, yes, this data is safe to work with and we can then continue to work on. And what that is simply going to do is to help us see the sort of problems that airlines face when they change aircraft on a particular route, uh, especially in going from an aircraft with a larger capacity to an aircraft with a smaller capacity. What impact is this going to have on, first of all, turning people off who can't get a seat, but also what's going to be the impact on the actual profit on board the aircraft and the load factors achieved. The last example we're going to look at, this is a, uh, a model that's been developed by Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, in conjunction with the Boeing company on what they call passenger origin destination system. Pods, that this replicates an airline revenue management system's actions over time and it takes into account previous applications. So it's important that the model uses historical booking data just as an airline in any day operations uses that historical data. And so 
what the pod system actually does is it takes past historical data and this is important because to get really good data we can't use the most recent one because airlines will regard this information as being part of their intellectual property. But much older data shows first of all a reality but also it's no longer commercial and confidence. If we look at the pod simulation system itself we have four different uh, elements. We have the passenger decision model, the revenue management optimizer, we have the forecaster and the historical booking database. If we look at the link between the forecaster and the historical booking database, we've spoken about this earlier and basically what the forecaster does is it takes information of historical bookings but also as the game progresses it updates it with the current information. The forecaster, of course, is important for a revenue management optimising system because it provides the information on what future bookings can occur and then the revenue management optimiser, when we play the game itself and we take into account the bookings that are made, it also puts that information back into uh, the forecaster which then updates the uh, bookings database. But the revenue management optimizer, that's the big one. That's the one that airlines use today and that helps go into the passenger decision model. First of all, it simply says, if we look at the seating configuration on board an aircraft, what are the number of first class, business class, premium economy, and that economy seats that we're gonna make available? Within those classes, what are gonna be the different price seats that we're gonna make available? just as we said uh, earlier in a previous lecture. And that goes into the passenger decision model. And then as we get our bookings come in and also we find out as to who has been canceled, who didn't get a seat, that goes back into the revenue management optimizer, back to the forecaster, back into the historical database. So this is a system that's used by the real airlines that can be used in a gaming situation to actually allow people to be able to be given data and said, okay, you're gonna run your airline according to this data. You can feed the data in, see how it then interacts with the forecaster and the historical bookings. And then as conditions change as they do with an airline, then you've got to make the decision and say, well, for example, are we gonna change our aircraft configuration and uh, have a lot more economy seats than business class seats simply because we find that at this time that the model is trying to simulate that there isn't the business there. So this is one of the big things that we get. And of course what it brings out is first of all the way in which you optimise your revenue for particular flight legs. It shows first of all that decision that airlines have to make. What's going to be our fair class mix problem? That is, what are going to be the different number of seats available and how are we going to break those seats into classes within themselves? And then also, how do we get the airline revenue management system products? That is, a forecast of the future bookings for each different um, class of seat and the subclasses within and work out our revenue from there. So if we take a look at the way in which the game is employed, we find out that it can be run employing five different airlines, servicing five hubs, servicing 40 spoke cities. So we can see our hub and spoke coming in here. Each airline has got one hub servicing 10 cities. That's part of the rules, just as with any game. Each hub's got two bi-directional connecting banks, each spoke. Uh, city is served by one to five competing airlines depending on the population. And so what we find here is getting an understanding as to the way the game operates, as to the way airlines operate and the sorts of decisions that have to be made. So a summary, in this particular lecture, we're touching on the surface only of the way in which airlines use measurement. We're going to be finding out the different tools that they use, operations research, model simulation and gaming. We're going to be looking at the impact of load factors and we'll work through a particular model to show as to actually what happens when we change our aircraft seat configuration so that we try to get a higher load factor 
but at the same time we get problems when some of our passengers are denied boarding simply because there's not a seat available and we can see the final impact on the airline revenue and the profit consideration. We're going to be talking about how modelling and simulation can be used to test airline requirements and we'll be looking at some of the actual models that the airlines use themselves to decide what aircraft do we need to buy, what aircraft should we be going out and leasing and what aircraft should we be phasing out. And we'll be talking about the way in which the MIT passenger origin destination system can be used to train people up where they actually get hands-on feeling for running an airline in a real world situation using actual data taken from airline operations. Thank you.